Ramadan. Assalamu alaikum and uh, welcome to Ramadan Journey. Uh, I am your host, Afif Khan, and our travel companion and guide through this journey is a Sheikh uh, Muhammad Al Asi. He is the author of the Ascendant Quran. Uh, it's the first ever tafsir of the Quran written directly in the English language. Uh, the subject of uh, this program and uh, the next few programs is going to be about the tafsir itself. Uh, we've been delving into uh, some of the analytical approaches of this particular tafsir. And uh, once again, uh, the perfect person to explain uh, what this tafsir is all about and uh, what its components consist of uh, is the Sheikh himself. And so, welcome to the program. Alhamdulillah. Uh, what we'd like to explore uh, as we go into this program is uh, uh, the Qur'an uh, refers uh, to many, many different kinds of behaviors. And it assigns uh, words to each of these uh, unique behaviors. Uh, but, but what we Muslims uh, do, unfortunately, is that uh, we lump all of these behaviors into a one-size-fits-all type of description. And so we just simply assign uh, one word to multiple different behaviors, but the, Quran, the Qur'anic language is very, very precise. And, uh, and if we sort of uh, miss the meanings of the words, uh, then we miss uh, what the Qur'an is trying to refer to. And uh, it takes us into tangents, and perhaps it may even take us into areas where we begin to kill each other because we really don't understand uh, the concepts that the Qur'an is trying to make us understand. And so for instance, uh, in, insofar as uh, dysfunctional behavior in society is concerned, uh, uh, there's kufr, uh, there's shirk, uh, there's fusuq, uh, uh, there's zulm, and, uh, and so could you explain uh, the differences uh, between these words? We got into the difference between kufr and zulm in the past uh, program. Uh, but as far as these other critical words are concerned, could you uh, uh, tell us the, uh, uh, the difference in the meanings of the words? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyid al-Mursaleen, rahmatillahi lil-alameen, wa ala alihi wa ashabihi al-hadeen al-muhtadeen. Yes, I think this is this is extremely important. This this question about the um, the delineation of the words in the Quran. Uh, honestly speaking, uh, Muslims, because of their absent-mindedness when reading the Quran, uh, it's easy for them to clump. A lot of words into one meaning and this is basically what's been going on in the translation of the meanings of the Quran and so you'll find you know the word kufr or the word shirk or the word fusuk or even the word uh, zulm all of these lumped together under one particular English word and even if they're not, if there's another word chosen, it would be uh, a synonymous word. It would not be a different meaning with a different definition. And so when you do something like that, you sort of uh, torpedo the, um, the purpose of that word in the context that it is in. I think one of the uh, earliest, if not the, the only one in our contemporary times who paid very close attention to this was Abu al-A'la al-Mawdudi. He wrote a book about the four critical idioms of the Qur'an, the four critical uh, vocabulary words in the Qur'an. And uh, lo and behold, after that, we haven't come across a major effort to try to explain the uh, different 
functional meanings of each of these words that should never be um, me meshed together with other words. Um, we spoke a little about, uh, in a previous program, we spoke a little about the word kufr and what it means. Uh, but let us, let us here take some vital examples, some ayat from the uh, impeccable Qur'an, and uh, get a feel for what we're saying here. Earlier, we mentioned the ayah in Surah Al-Kahf, وَقُلِ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيُؤْمِنْ وَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيَكْفُرْ Okay, and say, Al-Haqq is from your sustainer. So whoever wants to commit may do so, and whoever wants to deny may do so. I mean, speak about freedom. What more freedom do you want? If people want to think in certain ways, Allah is opening up that freedom to think in those certain ways. But then the ayah goes on to say, Inna a'tadina lidhalimina nara. We, in reference to Allah Azza wa Jal, we have prepared for a valimeen a fire. Not al-kafirin. Not al-kafirin. Before that, it said, وَلَقُلُوا حَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيُؤْمِنْ وَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيَكْفُرْ And then it goes on immediately to say, إِنَّا أَعْتَدْنَا لِلْظَالِمِينَ So, it didn't say for al-kafirin. It's referring to those who translate that kufr into... Uh, who transform that kufr. Remember we said right. there's a transformational nature of right. kufr, what, it, what was at one time a theory and an ideology and a political um, discourse, well, that is not there. It doesn't stay in library books and in the, in the strict heads of certain scholars. It has a way of institutionalizing itself. And from institutionalizing itself, it has a way of becoming a practice of injustice on earth. And that the consequences are there in this world and in the world to come. The consequences that befall al-valimeen, not necessarily al-kafirin. Al-hukmu yabqa ma'al kufr wa la yabqa ma'al thulm. A reference to what the Prophet or one of the scholars of Islam said, that governance may continue with kufr, but it cannot continue with dhulm. Uh, we're going to continue this discussion. Uh, we haven't uh, uh, really understood yet uh, the difference between kufr and shirk, uh, but in the coming segment, uh, we're going to get into that uh, discussion. Uh, but for now, we have to take a break. Uh, let our sponsors uh, advertise uh, their products and services. And uh, we'll be right back. Uh, please stay with us. Let's uh, go ahead and continue the discussion. Uh, we talked about kufr and dhun. Uh, let's talk about uh, the meaning of shirk and uh, fusuk. Uh, we covered, actually, we, uh, uh, we briefly mentioned the meaning of uh, fusuk in a previous ayah, in a previous program. Uh, but let's come back and uh, reiterate these meanings and see how they differ from kufr. So let's go on. Let's move on and, and take the word shirk or mushrikeen and the other derivatives uh, therein throughout the ayat of the Qur'an. Uh, we find that there is a very um, ominous threat uh, to those who are involved in uh, what you may call the cardinal sin of shirk. Uh, there's an ayah in the Qur'an that says, Allah will forgive any and all types of 
discrepancies, sins, mistakes, faults, you name it. Allah's mercy is comprehensive and it's open, except for shirk. It is, it's like an amazing revelation to Muslims that kufr is not... It's not, it's not it's, there. It, it's not a, a cardinal sin, yeah. Yeah, like, like shirk. Yeah, because shirk it becomes the... Uh, here's where I'm going to try to give it a fast definition. It's the institutionalization of the kufr. Shif, uh, shirk is its institutionalization. Zulm is the implementation, if you can follow that. First there is kufr, people thought out how they're going to deny Allah's power and authority. They went to explaining it, it could be in different political theories and ideological theories on the right and on the left. It's all around the place. Yes. But that's in the books. Right. What are you going to do? You're going to slaughter a book? You're going to take on a book or a person's thoughts? They're there, you can't. But then, there, and we said there's a transformational nature to this kufr and it, its, its uh, implications and its practice is zulm. But the, the critical link between kufr and zulm is the institutions that are responsible for this transformation from kufr into zulm. And that is shirk. Uh, and so that, that is why Allah says, you know, he, He's willing and wants. And you understand. My grace and my mercy is so expansive that it is inclusive of everything. But then the ayah says, Illa an yushraka bihi. In Allah yaghfiru dhunuba jami'a. Allah will amnesty all types of sins and crimes even, except an yushraka bihi, that someone commits the cardinal sins of shirk uh, to Allah. So, you know, when you look at it, in, if we want to bring it down to today's language, it becomes those who are involved in the the officialdom, the governments, the administrations that implement this type of shirk and then it's processed into the injustice, the victimhood, the oppression that exists in the expanse of the world. So then we go on to, I hope I, you know, in the little time frame that we have, uh, gave somewhat of uh, uh, an explanation to a shirk. Then there's a, uh, an ayah that says, Inna shirka la zulmun azim. Shirk is a, uh, a grand expression of injustice. So if people are having problems identifying where shirk is, Look at the largest and the most ominous and grandiose expression of oppression, of zulm and injustice in the world. That becomes the habitat of the mushrikeen. That, that is a, an indicator of what shirk is. Not the petty stuff. Even though, uh, like when, when we were speaking about Ramadan, there are basic elements. There's the DNA of the psychology that goes into Ramadan, the same way there is a DNA that goes into the psychology of, of shirk. And um, there's another area that says, وَمَا يُؤْمِنُ أَكْثَرُهُمْ إِلَّا وَهُمْ مُشْرِكُونَ Most of them do not commit themselves to Allah except that they are mushriks. So the traces of this shirk is to be found even among those who say that they commit themselves to Allah. Then we come to the uh, meaning or trying to uh, define the meaning of fusuq. Uh, I think we may have mentioned this quickly in a previous um, program. Uh, but al-fusuq in its um, 
organic original meaning is the coming apart of the uh, basic elements of a substance. In, in the, um, in the uh, primitive way of putting it, you can, you, can, you can say some dates spoiled. Like a decomposition. A decomposition, that's the exact word. The decomposition of the elements of a substance. But here we're speaking about the human element. So when there's a decomposition in the issue of allegiance or in the issue of affirming Allah's authority and power. In that area, when there sets in a decomposition there, it is referred to as fusuq. And there's a demonstration of that in the history of Musa and Bani Israel. I don't know if we're going to have further time to expand on that. If we will, I certainly will. If we don't, I know the the viewers are aware that we are under time restrictions. And uh, we're going to continue to try to understand uh, the meanings of some uh, critical concepts uh, in the Qur'an. Uh, we're going to uh, explore a couple more of those uh, concepts in the next segment. Uh, but for now, we have to give time to our sponsors. Uh, please stay with us. Uh, we'll be right back. And welcome back. Uh, we are talking about, uh, in the last segment, we were talking about Fusuq, and uh, we need to clarify that uh, just a little bit. And uh, so, Shaykh Al Asi, uh, continue with the explanation of Fusuq. Yes. Um, I think this is very important because it is a, uh, a word that is encountered many times in the Qur'an. We have to be clear about this and we have at least one example that can clarify uh, what fusuq means. Uh, there's a, in Surah Al-Ma'idah, there is a discourse on a certain historical development that took place between Musa السلام, and Bani Israel, the people who were with him. Uh, Allah Jalla wa ala, He has assigned the Holy Land to the followers of Scripture and in this case to the, follow, the followers of Musa. And so uh, they were reminded of their privilege. Many Israel were reminded of their pr privilege and their position and the task of uh, being responsible and sacrificing uh, subjects of Allah Azza wa Jal. And so Musa, after many years of being with them, there came a time when he said to them that they should enter into the Holy Land. Very clear said to them, enter into the holy land which Allah has designated for you. So here, instead of, I mean, it's that, it should make, be clear, and they know who's in that holy land. And they responded to Musa, they said, inna fiha qawman jabbarin. Uh, but in that land there is something like a people of superpower status. And look at who we are. We're sort of like nothing here. We're not equipped. We, uh, this is... So um, they refused, to make a long story short, they refused to shoulder their combat duties. And so what do you say about these people? They're not kafirs. They didn't develop any type of... Yeah. mental structure to argue this whole thing. No ideological position. Here. No, yeah, so it's, it's plain, what happened here is that covenant, that pledge that they had 
with the Creator, with the Almighty, sh began to show its decomposition. They didn't have the courage, they didn't have the motivation uh, to move them into that area of responsibility, which is to face off against a power. Because if they, if they, in their depth, in the depths of their own selves, if they were certain they are with Allah, they wouldn't say, oh, there's a big power out there. Because what power can overpower Allah? So the, the defining uh, word for them here was Musa's comment on this. Said Musa, O my sustainer, I can only vouch for myself and for my brother. So have us part, have us leave the company of people who are fasiqeen. You see, the fusuq here is a definition of the disintegration of their pledge and covenant with Allah the Almighty. This is where this applies. Now, when Muslims encounter this word in the other ayat in the Quran, the question is, do they focus their mind on this area and this element that has come apart? Because these people, they may have been the most intensive ritualistic people in the world. They would have been offering their salah and they would have been fasting and doing all of these other rituals that all the other people of scripture do. But that did not exempt them when the time came. That did not exempt them from displaying their true inner selves that could not bear the responsibilities that will mean that they were going to have to sacrifice. Which comes out in a crisis. Right? Yeah. There's a crisis and then your true selves come out. Exactly. Right. And this is what happened and this is how we get the definition of fasiqi. So uh, in the next uh, two minutes, quickly, could you uh, explain uh, how uh, the word fasad differs from what you've described so far? Yeah, fasad is a, uh, is a collective effort. Uh, it, 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 when we take a look at uh, let, let me put it this way. I'm trying to make it as easy as possible here with, with the least amount of words. Fusuk, a little linguistic help here for those who are familiar with the Arabic language. Most of the words that begin with fat, the F, they indicate uh, a rupture, something coming apart. Cleavage. A cleavage or a gap. You know, there's that break. So when we, we use the word fasaqa, it is that uh, disintegration that occurs in the area of commitment and pledge to Allah in the human psyche, in the human heart, in the human conscience. When we, when we say fasad, it is the same thing, but we're speaking about right now not the internal in psychology of man, but we're talking about the society yes. and so the environment. When this disintegration begins to occur in the material world, not in the psychic world, when it... So it's the social analog to Fasul, in a sense. Yeah, in a sense, you can put it that way. It's, it probably wraps it all up. Okay. Uh, and this brings us to the end uh, of this particular program. We just run out of time, it's unfortunate. Uh, we're just getting into these discussions, but uh, we'll continue uh, trying to understand the concepts of the Qur'an in the next program. Uh, we again uh, are very appreciative of the fact that you joined in with us so far. Uh, we'd like to see you back again, same time, same channel. Uh, I am your host, Afif Khan, um, and uh, uh, we'll see you back again. Wassalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Oh.